Shalom, shalom, we are back. Hope you all had a good break. And we are going to jump straight into 2 Samuel 6, verse 1 to 7, verse 17. And then we'll look at, I think, Marcos 10, I think it is. Okay, so you're reading, Kathleen. Okay. Now David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David rose up and went with all the people who were with him from Baalai Yehuda to bring up from there the Ark of Elohim that is called by the name, the name Yahweh of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. And they placed the Ark of Elohim on a new wagon and brought it from the house of Avinadav, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Achio, sons of Avinadav, were leading the new wagon. And they brought it from the house of Avinadav, which was on the hill, with the Ark of Elohim. And Achio was walking before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were dancing before Yahweh with all instruments of fir wood and with lyres and with harps and with tambourines and with sistrums and with cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nachon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of Elohim and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the wrath of Yahweh burned against Uzzah, and Elohim struck him there for the fault. And he died there by the ark of Elohim. And David was displeased because Yahweh had broken out against Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Peretz Uzzah until this day. And David was afraid of Yahweh on that day and said, How shall the ark of Yahweh come to me? And David would not move the ark of Yahweh with him into the city of David. But David turned it aside to the house of Uvet Edom the Gittite. And the ark of Yahweh remained in the house of Uvet Edom the Gittite. Gittite three new moons, and Yahweh blessed Obed Edom and all his house. And it was reported to Sovereign David, saying, Yahweh has blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that he has, because of the ark of Elohim. David then went, went and brought up the ark of Elohim from the house of Obed Edom to the, house, to the city of David with rejoicing. And it came to be, when those bearing the ark of Yahweh had gone six steps, that he sorted bulls and fatted sheep. And David danced before Yahweh with all his might, and David was wearing a linen shoulder garment. Thus David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of Yahweh with shouting and with a voice of a shofar. And it came to be, when the ark of Yahweh came into the city of David, that Michal, daughter of Shaul, looked through a window and saw sovereign David leaping and dancing before Yahweh, and she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of Yahweh in, and set it in its place in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it. And David brought ascending offerings before Yahweh, and peace offerings. And when David had finished bringing ascending offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of Yahweh of hosts. And he apportioned to all the people, to all the crowd of Israel, from man even to woman, to each one a loaf of bread, and a measure, and a cake of raisins. And all the people left, each one to his house. And David returned to bless his household. And Michal, the daughter of Shaul, came out to meet David and said, How esteemed was the sovereign of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the female servants of his servants, as one of the foolish ones, shamelessly un uncovering himself. So David said to Michal, Before Yahweh, who chose me instead of your father and all his house, commanded me to be ruler over the people of Yahweh, over Israel, so I danced before Yahweh. And I shall be even more slight than this, and shall be humble in my own eyes. But as for the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I am esteemed. And Michal, the daughter of Shaul, had no children to the day of her death. And it came to be when the sovereign was dwelling in his house, and Yahweh had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the sovereign said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I am dwelling in a house of cedar, but the ark of Elohim dwells within curtains. And Nathan said to the sovereign, Go, do all that is in your heart, for Yahweh is with you. And it came to be that night that the word of Yahweh came to Nathan, saying, Go and say to my servant David, Thus said Yahweh, Would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Mitzrayim, even to this day but have moved about in a tent and in a dwelling place. Wherever I have walked with all the children of Israel, 
Have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? And now say to my servant David, Thus said Yahweh of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the flock, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great ones who are on the earth. And I shall appoint a place for my people Israel, and shall plant them, and they shall dwell in a place of their own, and no longer be afraid. Neither shall the children of wickedness oppress them again, as at the first. Even from the day I commanded rulers over my people Israel, and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. And Yahweh has declared to you that he would make you a house. When your days are filled and you rest with your fathers, I shall raise up your seed after you, who comes from your inward parts, and shall establish his reign. He does build a house for my name, and I shall establish the throne of his reign for ever. I am to be his father, and he is my son. If he does perversely, I shall reprove him with the rod of men, and with the blows of the sons of men. But my loving commitment does not turn aside from him, as I turned it aside from Shaul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your reign are to be steadfast for ever before you. Your throne is established for ever. According to all these words, and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Okay, so here we're looking at this passage of uh, bringing back the ark of Yahweh and Renee saying, didn't we read this recently? I remember commenting on the steps and how much they must have slaughtered. <coughs> yeah, we did read a, a account of this. And uh, it's good that you bring it to remembrance, but we're reading it in today's portion as part of a clear lesson on what not to do as and what to do. And what we see here, um, you can also read about this or these events in 1 Chronicles 13, but in order to understand where this section starts with David saying, let's go and get the ark, we have to understand the history in order to see what a big occasion this was and some of the mistakes that David had made and then a proper order brought about to bring Yahweh's presence and the promise that Yahweh would give to David for his son Shalom if he would walk in his ways. And so many years before, Israel were encamped at even, even Ezer or Ebenezer uh, in battle against the Philistines, and they lost about 40,000 or 4,000 men, sorry, in battle. So they'd lost quite a lot of guys, and the elders cried out, and the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh was brought up into the midst of the camp of the army. And they started raising a great shout and a great shout. And the Philistines thought, gee whiz, there's a great shout. What are we going to do? Because the Ark of Yahweh has come into their camp. How are we going to survive? And the Philistines strengthened themselves. And they said, don't worry, we'll still go out and, and get them. And they actually destroyed Israel that day. And this was the day that Hophni's sons were put to death in battle. Uh, um, not Hophni, um, Eli, Eli's sons, Hophni and Pinchas, were put to death. We mentioned that because they were the ones that were doing corrupt service at the door of the, the tent of meeting, and they, they were just whoring with uh, uh, the ladies that would come there, etc. And they were just, it was corrupt. And when news came back from the, the battle that the Ark of Yahweh had been stolen uh, and Hophni and Pinchas were dead, Eli fell off his chair backwards and broke his neck. I mean, he was an old man. And his daughter-in-law, when she heard that uh, uh, the ark had been stolen and her, her husband was taken and, uh, and Eli is also dead, she went into labor and gave premature birth to a son which she called Ichavot, which means the esteem of Yahweh departs. So we see all of this happening here, and it was a, a terrible time. And, and the ark of Yahweh went into Philistine captivity for about seven months. And it first went, uh, it went from one place to the next. And what the, the Philistines did, they first set it up in there next to Baal. And when they came in the morning, they saw that their statue of Baal had fallen over. And so they picked Baal up and put him back on his place. 
The next morning came back and not only has he fallen over, but his head was chopped off and his hands were chopped off. So they thought this is terrible. Yahweh is destroying us. And so they said, we can't have the ark here. So they moved it from city to city. They just said, let it go out here. And Yahweh plagued the Philistines with tumors. And so they got together and they said, listen, Yahweh is destroying us. We need to send this ark back. So they went and got cows that had never been yoked. And they said, listen, we're going to build a, a, a wagon for this, Put it, let the, the cattle go, put the ark on there. If it goes on the road and it stays on the road, we send it away to Beit Shemesh and let it go, then we know that we've done the right thing because Yahweh's been plaguing us. If it goes its own way and it kind of just wanders in the field, then we know it's not Yahweh, so that's what they thought. So they did exactly that. They went and put it uh, on a wagon. They sent it off. They even made golden tumors and golden rats, and they put them in the ark to, or with the ark, they put it with the ark, not in the ark, they put it there as presents, you know, to, to kind of appease the, the, the torture that Yahweh was plaguing them with. And so um, they, uh, after sending it out, um, it, was, it was coming to the field of Beit Shemesh, and when the, when the people saw the ark, the, well, these cows coming with the ark of Yahweh on it, they, they started celebrating that the Ark of Yahweh is coming back. It was like seven months or so. Then they took the Ark off. They used the cart. They slaughtered the animals and they offered an offering to Yahweh and they were praising. Some of the men opened the Ark and looked in and they were put to death. And so they set the Ark aside to the house of Avinadav where it remained for about 40 years. And it was during this time that King Shaul was reigning. And not once did King Shaul consider getting the Ark of Yahweh back because he, he's a picture, a clear picture of not one chosen by Yahweh, that he was all in it for himself, etc. And it was only after uh, uh, King Shaul had died and David had been brought back and set up as sovereign that we come to this account where David says we must bring the Ark of Yahweh back. And he pitched a tent for it. He set up a whole service around the ark, which we see in the book of Acts, where we're told that Yahweh will restore the booth of David. Now, what that's a replication of is the right way to worship. He instituted a worship service round the clock, 24 divisions that would worship Yahweh in this booth that he had made, continually worshiping as a reflection of what is in the heavens when the Kerovim are constantly declaring, set apart, set apart, set apart, Yahweh El Shaddai or Yahweh of hosts. And so this is the booth of David that's being referred to in Acts. It's a proper restoration of the pure worship that's in complete set apartness. It's not mixed. It's not strange fire. It's complete. It's set apart. It's how we draw near to Yahweh. But before that happened, when David set up the tent, David thought, hey, Let's get the ark back. Now, you must remember, it's not an excuse. They learned the hard way. They go and fetch the ark. They go, a big procession of people go to the house of Abinadav, and it's been there. Now you've got Achio, Achio and Uzzah, who grew up in this house, knowing that the ark's there with them. They certainly would have understood, don't look in the ark, because the guys 40 years ago that looked in the ark died. So they understood the, the reverence that was to be had there because the house of Avinadav certainly obviously was, was blessed with having Yahweh's presence in, the, in, in their house. So when they wanted to take the ark, what did they do? Oh, let us make a new wagon. First mistake. They should never have made a wagon. So it shows that in their zeal to get Yahweh's presence back, they didn't do what was required by looking in the Torah, how do we bear Yahweh's presence? And so as the, the wagon's going along, Achio's in the front, he's, he's leading the way, and, and they come to the house of Nachon, or the, near the house of Nachon, and the, the oxen stumbled, or the wagon, you know, the wagon hit a bump in the road kind of thing, and Uzzah jumps out and he thinks he can save the ark, and he dies. He touches the ark and he dies. And obviously David feared Yahweh, and he was a bit upset and angry, and he called the place Perez, uh, um, Peretz Uzzah, which is breakout against Uzzah. And, you know, and so they then went back to Yerushalayim and they put the, well, they first put the Ark of Yahweh in the house of Oved Edom and they went back to Yerushalayim. And David was kind of upset. What do I do now? How am I supposed to get his Ark back? Look what he does. And realizing the wrath of Yahweh if you don't do what's required. So they 
consulted the Torah, they went back and then they commanded the priests to make sure that they are clean and that they are ready to go and fetch Yahweh's ark his way. When we, we've been through Shemot for the last couple of weeks, we realize, we know the design of the tabernacle. The poles that were to be put on, on, in the rings that were on the side of the ark were for lifting the ark, which the sons of Kehath were to uh, um, wrap once Aharon or carry once Aharon had wrapped and his sons had wrapped the ark in its presence. So we see that there was clear order of how you bear it. And uh, the sons of Kehath didn't have wagons. Uh, Gershon and Merari both had wagons to carry the tent pegs and the slaught and the poles and the curtains and the coverings, etc. But the, the slaughter place, the slaughter place of incense and the Ark of the Covenant and the showbread table were all articles that were carried by poles. And so we see David went, they, they, they corrected their approach, got the priesthood clean the way they should be, came back. Well, after three months, because it was reported, listen, look how Obed Edom's house is prospering. You know, and when it says there that the house of Obed Edom prospered, you must know it wasn't just him feeling good about himself. It means everything in his house, his servants, his flocks, his fields, everything prospered more than everybody else. In a three month period, to see that his entire household prospered, you had to know that it prospered greatly for everyone to recognize. And David said, We need to get Yahweh's presence. He understood, you know, remember we just spoke about the word kasher or kosher? to be advantageous or to prosper. He knew it's advantageous and prosperous for us to have Yahweh's presence and have a right order restored. Yahweh's presence left because of the whoring. Let's restore it right now. Got everybody right. And as they were coming back, which we read not so long ago, Renee, we looked at this taking six steps and the seventh step they rested and slaughtered to Yahweh or they stopped and slaughtered thanks to Yahweh. So the ark was brought back. And as they were bringing the ark back, David was dancing. And he, was in his, and he was in linen garments. So he'd taken his kingly robes off, his royal attire. And this, in the eyes of his wife, Michal, who was the daughter of Shaul, was not right in her eyes. And he was despised in her eyes. And, he's, and, you know, and, and she comes along and says, why are you being like this today? Are you degrading yourself? Look at you. you, know, you, you what are you doing here? And... She says, how esteemed was the sovereign of Israel uncovering himself today in the eyes of all. In other words, why are you making yourself like these little people down here? Shows you where her heart was at. And he goes and he says, before Yahweh chose me, before Yahweh who chose me instead of your father in his house commanded me to be ruler. Now what's interesting here, we see she calls him sovereign, which is the Hebrew word melech, which is king. Now we know Yahweh, when Israel wanted a king, Shemuel is upset because... He said, Yahweh is your king. And he said, give them what they want. He gave them King Shaul. Then he chose David, the beloved, from behind the sheepfold. Now, David was a humble man too, a man after the heart of Yahweh. He doesn't say, oh, yes, Yahweh chose me as king. He said, Yahweh chose me to be ruler, which is the Hebrew word nagid, which is a leader, a ruler, or a prince. So we often see in scripture the prince, you know, being mentioned. So it's a, again, he realized I'm, I've been given a leadership role, but it's Yahweh who's the king. And he said, so I danced before Yahweh. He basically is saying, I know who my king is. I'm not the one in charge. I'm submitted to him like everybody else. And so I'm dancing in joy before him. And I'll even be more slight than this. And the Hebrew word for slight carries the meaning of humble. In other, in other words, I'll even lower myself more than this. You, the, the wife of David was saying, you should be up here. They should be worshiping you kind of thing. And he's saying, no, I'll bring myself lower. Less of me, more of Yahweh, you know. And he then gave everybody, you know, supplies of raisins and, uh, um, and bread. It's a clear picture of provision, you know. And what we see here, this is a shadow picture. The actions of David here is a shadow picture of our Messiah who took it. We read earlier in Philippians who did not consider equality with, uh, um, with Elohim something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking it on the form of a servant, humbled himself. He laid down his deity. And that's what David, yes, he was sovereign of Israel, 
But he danced with the servants, bringing the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh back, provided the means for everybody, showing how when Messiah came as a servant, he came to provide us the nourishment, the necessary provisions for us to worship the master in spirit and in truth. And so <clears throat> part of the, the curse for Michal despising David is she would never have a child. In other words, she would not have her womb blessed. You know, and so when now everything's settled, the tent of David is set up, the worship's happening, happening around it, and then David kind of feels a bit, hold on, but Yahweh's dwelling in a tent, I'm dwelling in this house, I want to make a house. And Nathan the prophet says, you're doing what's right in your heart, but I'm going to go speak to Yahweh, and Yahweh tells Nathan to tell David, you're not going to build a house, your son is going to build a house. And I am to be his father, and he is to be my son. These words are also prophetic shadow pictures of the fulfillment of time, which will take place on the eighth day. We're looking at the Torah portion eighth today, and I mentioned earlier from Chazon when Yeshua Messiah said, the one who overcomes shall inherit all this, and I'll be a father to him, and he'll be a son to me. So here again is this clear witness of Yahweh saying, I am to be a father and he is to be my son. I'll discipline him. I'm not going to take my loving commitment from him. And then the fulfillment of that promise is the ones who overcome the true sons that have endured the discipline of the master, been trained by it, bringing about the peaceable fruit of righteousness, will inherit with our master and rule and reign with him. And we'll be sons and daughters of the Most High. And that's a shadow picture. As we look at this, we see so many things taking place. When David and, and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of Yahweh with shouting, that Hebrew word for shouting and with the voice of a shofar is teruah. So we are now, we've just, it's the second of the sixth month. We're looking forward to the seventh month that's drawing near a remembrance of shouting. What do we have a remembrance of? That we're betrothed. And this pattern here was a celebration of the remembrance who their true sovereign is and bringing back the sovereign into their presence, learning the lessons. Don't carry him the wrong way. Don't look into his ark. Don't draw near to him the wrong way. Go according to the Torah and it's well with you. So yes, every six steps they stopped and and, and, and slaughtered to Yahweh, again, a picture of we work six days and the seventh day we come into his presence. There was more slaughter offerings on the Sabbath than any other day besides the other feasts. So what we're taking note of here is this clear, wonderful picture of David representing Messiah coming to restore a house of worship, you know. And, and this is a powerful witness that we see here, learning not to be, you know, Uzzah means strength. Uziyahu means Yahweh is my strength. Now, a lot of people might feel strong in themselves, but when you're not doing it Yahweh's way, you'll be shown to be weak. And when you humble yourself, Yahweh will lift you up. Just as David, he wasn't saying, yes, I'm king. He said, I'll even be more humble than this, you know. And what the world sees us doing in walking in humility to them, they, look, they think that we look like just fools that are acting shamelessly, where we say, no, no, no. We are wise ones with oil in our lamps, ready. You know, Yom Teruah is that wakening blast, that shout, where the wise ones are found to have oil in their lamps, as opposed to the fools without oil, representing those who are walking according to the flesh and not according to the Torah, not according to the spirit of Yahweh. Anybody want to share their thoughts? That's in summary what we've just read. I'll just correct myself. It was about 60 years that the ark was in the house of Avin Avinadab. And during the, during the reign of King Shaul, you think about it, he was not interested in Yahweh's presence whatsoever. But David had the heart to have Yahweh back. And it's the same today. There are many people out there wanting an identity as a covenant people, wanting the blessings of Yahweh. Yet they actually don't really want Yahweh's presence, which goes back to what we were saying earlier, how set apart is Yahweh to you? How much esteem are you bringing to the Father? Is he your Father? Are you allowing him to discipline you as a father disciplines a child? The book of Hebrews speaks about that. You know, when we look at these events, there were two main compromises that caused the death of Uzzah. 
Firstly, it was a failure to transport the ark correctly. It's in the book of Numbers 4 verse 15. It's told, the sons of Kehath shall lift them up, but let them not touch that which is set apart lest they die. Because Aharon and his sons would first cover all the materials within the set apart place and the most set apart place, the ark, with all the different wrappings. And then Kehath would come in and lift them up and carry them. And they also failed to heed the no touch clause, you know. Yahweh makes it clear that even within the design of the tabernacle, whoever touches it must be set apart. So we also see from these accounts that when they went with great zeal to get the ark, they weren't, didn't go properly prepared. They didn't go according to the Torah. So they weren't set apart, you know. And compromise disrespects the word of Yahweh. We spoke about the word earlier, talking about contempt. You know, the, the word Zara, to profane, to con treat Yahweh with contempt. And this is, this is some of the effects of compromise that endanger our walk of set-apartness, is when compromise sets in, it disrespects Yahweh's word, and that's what people don't realize. It devastates the people of Yahweh. Firstly, Uzzah was the son of Avinadav, as I said, from Kiriath Ya'arim. Secondly, having an ark kept there for around 60 years, Uzzah would have listened over the years about his father speaking about the ark of Yahweh. What caused him to think that he needs to save Yahweh? Because the ark represented Yahweh's presence, you know. Maybe they were just so puffed up, they got the big move. They got the, you go ahead, you go in the front. It started out wrong. It should never have been on a wagon. That's the first mistake. And so down the line, we can find the consequences of initial mistakes causing further mistakes. And then people want to ask the question, when those further mistakes are dealt with, why is this happening to me when it didn't start out right in the first place? And compromise deflects the blessing of Yahweh. So no longer was the blessing going to come into Yerushalayim or sit with the house of Avinadav because, you know, his son's now dead. It now goes to Obed Edom. So when you're carrying Yahweh's presence incorrectly, his presence leaves you and it will go on the shoulders of the ones who are going to carry him correctly. You know? So David did a number of things wrong. Firstly, he consulted the leaders and the whole assembly while never actually approaching Yahweh on bringing back the ark. Yehoshua did the same thing before when having a covenant meal with the Givenites before seeking Yahweh, who he thought these people were from afar. It teaches us a valuable yet lesson. When our master says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, that means you seek Yahweh first. Now, there's counsel in the wisdom of many, but if Yahweh is not being head of that seeking process, then you are opening the door for compromise to come in. And David ended up doing what was right in the eyes of people. You, look, if Yahweh is not the one that's being sought first amongst a group of people seeking, and you just get together and you try and think, oh, what's the best way? Without seeking Yahweh, believe you me, you'll end up doing what's right in the eyes of people without consulting. Is this right in Yahweh's eyes? You know? And he copied the way of the Philistines. So when you do what's right in your own eyes, you'll end up doing what the world does. We've said many times there are many things in this world that are deemed to be acceptable and okay, but in Yahweh's eyes, it's not. And so we can't follow the patterns of the world to try and retain Yahweh's presence when their pattern clearly is abominable in Yahweh's eyes. So the clear lesson that we have here today is stop following falsehood, you know, David allowed Uzzah and Achio to drive the presence of Yahweh. We have to be led by the set-apart spirit of Yahweh and not the other way around. We're not leading Yahweh's spirit, and I think a lot of people are trying to do that today. They think they can orchestrate and demand which way the spirit of Yahweh turns for them. And so David failed to keep Yahweh's standards. It was the Levites who were supposed to be the musicians, and here the assembly were playing the instruments. So again, proper order and structure was not in place. It sounds harsh, but that was the standard. 
And we need to be reminded and made aware of the fact that we are a set-apart nation, a royal priesthood, a treasured possession. And in the order of Melchizedek, yes, we all have the ability in our master to play instruments and make music, but there's still order that must be adhered to and properly followed as a proper submission to the leadership that those he appoints over the body to listen. It won't go well with you, Hebrews 13 says, when you don't listen to those that are appointed over you to direct your steps according to the word. But what happens is people think they can carry Yahweh's presence, expect his blessings, but they're listening to the world. And they're seeking first the world and its ways. David allowed flesh to touch the presence of Yahweh. We are to worship Yahweh in spirit and truth. We don't worship him the way it feels good to us for the moment and how we think we can orchestrate that. You know, if only David had, you know, he feared Yahweh when Uzzah got struck. If only he had feared him before all of this happened, before they even left the house of Avinadah, you know. So he was a man like us that learned some valuable lessons. And I'm sure many of us can uh, 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 recognize certain areas in our lives where we have allowed compromise to the standards of the word. And I'm not saying it's okay. It's definitely not okay. We all deserve to be struck down like Uzzah was struck down. When we think we're strong and mighty, you know, that's why Shaul says, when I'm weak, I am strong. Because when I let less of myself and I die to self and put my things to death, so that Messiah can be that which strengthens me, my purpose, my life, and everything is for him. We don't just want a form of reverence with no power. We want proper reverence with the power of Elohim and the power and the authority of his word that leads and directs our lives, a light for our path correctly so we don't stumble. Because when his Torah is leading your path, there won't be any stumbling block in your way. That's another picture. By this oxen stumbling, it shows that this wasn't a Torah observant path, you know. And so we need to see today as we have to uh, look very clearly at what the world's doing in a sense of they don't care where Yahweh's presence is. But we, the beloved who are seeking his return, we've got to exercise control and proper reverence over the zeal we might have to have him with us by making sure it's done his way or not our own way. Amen? Anybody want to share their thoughts on, on this? It's a valuable passage of Scripture which ties in nicely with the strange fire that, Uz, uh, that uh, Nadav and Avihu brought, you know. And when David brought it back, there was ascending offerings, there was peace offerings, and he blessed the people in the name of Yahweh. It was a proper restoration of his presence. And this is what we're looking forward to in the culmination of the appointed times of Yahweh, is that coming together in the book of Yechezkiah, when it speaks about the millennial reign, and once the temple has been cleansed for the seven days, then you bring your ascending offerings and your peace offerings. Here David gave ascending offerings and peace offerings. It's a clear witness of the proper worship of Yahweh being established firmly here on earth. That's what we're looking forward to. Now we can either be struck down by Uzzah, like Uzzah, not by Uzzah, like Uzzah, because we think we can handle Yahweh's word any which way we want and not take the responsibility of carrying, bearing his presence correctly on our shoulders, lifting him up the way we should and get struck down, or we adhere to his standard of his word, bear one another's burden so as to complete the Torah of Messiah, we carry his presence correctly and with great joy in walking in humility that is a strength, it's not a weakness, with great rejoicing heart, having a proper worship restored, not being afraid of what others might think when they see our obedience. Do you think David was fazed by what his wife had to say in disgust of his so-called worship? Let them by observing your good works. Praise Elohim in the day of his visitation because everyone will acknowledge that he is saviour and king. Did you want to share yeah, something? That's how he said, I don't think, I'm not before them. Before, them. I'm I'm before, before Yahweh. Yahweh. Yes. 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 Not about those around. Yes. 
I'm like one of them. I'm just like one of them. Yes, yeah. And David understood that. But it took an incident for David to understand. I mean, David is one that followed after Yahweh, but he had to. This brought him even further. Even in his role of king that he was now being established in, he had to realize too, he is still a servant of Yahweh. You know? And that's when you can display the biggest strength. What does a corrupt system do? It's a pyramid scheme that's trying to get you to the top. And that's not scriptural at all. You know? And I say this every time we meet that, but it's still my favorite thing about it all is that he didn't settle down in his own house until no. he settled his people down. Yes. So he's so concerned about. He's so with them yes. in the tent. They yeah. were in tents. Until he settled them and he gave them a, a promised land and then he settled with them. Yeah. Okay, who'd like to read Mark 7? Mark 7. Last, last week we read from 28 onwards, I think, so now we're reading Mark 7, 1 to 23. Yeah. It's a gold dot before you there. It is. Okay, good. Okay. And the Pharisees and uh, some of the scribes assembled to him, having uh, come from Jerusalem and seen uh, some of the taught ones uh, eating bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, uh, they found fault. Uh, for the Pharisees, as uh, all the Yudim, uh, do eat, so do not eat unless they wash uh, their hands uh, thoroughly, holding fast to the tradition of the elders. And, and coming from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and uh, there uh, are many uh, other traditions which have uh, received and hold fast. The washing of a cup, utensils, and copper vessels and couches. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, uh, Why do your taught ones uh, not wash according to the traditions? Sorry, walk according to the tradition uh, of the elders? and eat bread with unwashed hands. And he, and he answering said to them, Well, did Yehuda prophesy, sorry, did Yoshiahu prophesy concerning you hypocrites? Um, um, as it has been written, the people respect me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me. And in vain do they worship me, uh, teaching and teachings of commands of men. Forsaking the, the command of Elohim, you hold a fast uh, to the tradition of men. And he said to them, Well, uh, do you uh, set aside the command of Elohim in order to guard your tradition? For Moshe said, Respect your father and your mother. And um, he who uh, curses uh, your Curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But uh, you say, if a man uh, says uh, to his father or mother, uh, whatever profit uh, you might have received from me um, is Koban, uh, you no longer let him uh, do uh, any matter at all uh, for his father or his mother. Nullify the word of Elohim uh, through your tr tradition, uh, which uh, you have uh, handed down, and many such uh, traditions uh, you do. And uh, calling uh, the crowd to him, he said to them, Hear me, uh, and everyone, and understand. There is no matter that enters a there is no matter that enters a man from outside which is able to defile him, but it is what comes out of him uh, that defiles the man. If anyone has uh, ears to hear, uh, let him hear. And when he uh, went from the crowd into the house, his taught ones uh, asked him concerning uh, the parable. And he said to them, Are you also without understanding? Do you not uh, perceive that whatever enters a man uh, from 
outside is unable to defile him uh, because it does not uh, enter his heart uh, but his stomach and uh, is eliminated thus purged of all, all the food and he said uh, what comes out of a man uh, that defiles a man uh, for from within um, out of the heart of men proceive uh, evil reasons adult uh, adulteresses uh, whoring murder theft uh, greedy desires wickedness deceit uh, indecency and evil eye blasphemy pride uh, foolish, uh, foolishness all these wicked matters uh, come from within and defile a man Okay, so we spoke about this before lunch. I think it's very clear, um, unless you, you'd like to dig further into it, but we spoke clearly about this when looking at the, the clean and unclean um, in Vaikra 11. Just touching what we didn't touch on is Yeshua then said to him, you've got many such traditions. One is it says, the word says, respect your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. And he says, but you say, in other words, you, contrary to the word, this is what you say. The word says this, but this is what you do. This is one of, and he says, and you have many such traditions. The traditions are nullifying the word. And what they says is, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that is a gift, you no longer let him do any matter at all for his father or mother, nullifying the word of Elohim through your tradition. In other words, what they're saying is korban, which we know, so they try and use spiritual words or scriptural words, Korban, which is to draw near, which is what all the sacrifices are about, or it means uh, insert that which draws near as a gift to Yahweh. So they wanted to relinquish. If somebody had something and they see, they need to take care of their parents. And it's like, remember, it's always in the context of Torah observance. Now they say, yeah, no, I'm, I've got to give weight to my mother and father and I've got to, you know, see to them and make sure they're okay. But now what I've got to help them with, actually it's, a, it's something that's set aside for another purpose. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's a gift that I can't, so I can't take of that. So you don't actually do what's required as a faithful, dutiful son. You know, in the context of Torah observance, it's always with that. So this is what they were doing. So then they said, okay, if you say something's korban, you then have to, you're basically releasing yourself from the right to respect your father and mother and do what needs to be done to them within the Torah observance framework. And that's what Yeshua is saying. You've got these commands. This is what it says, but this is what you're doing. And you're doing it because of the traditions that have been handed down by the elders. In other words, it wasn't this is a first generation. This is something that's come down, and it's the same thing today. People are doing certain things because, well, that's the way it was always done. And not stopping to think, but why am I doing this? Most of us are sitting in the position we're in today, serving our master, because we began to ask the question, why am I doing this when they are doing, why, why are we doing this when the word says that? Where did the but we do this come in? And that is what people are doing, not just with, what is food and not is what is not food. It's just what is obedience and what's not obedience, you know. So when people are feeding the flesh, they'll construct a tradition and they'll, that tradition will become a teaching of men that is taught as commands, nullifying the word of Elohim by their commands and their false teachings. So I think it's very clear we discussed earlier what's clean and what happens to food when it goes in your stomach. And we have to be on guard against letting the Torah is to be on our heart. And what should be coming out of our beings is that which is befitting for a set-apart follower of Messiah. It should be clean and not defiled things. What defiles us is not what goes in by natural food. It's what comes out of us because Basically, what you're setting your eyes on, what are you allowing into your heart? What are you allowing into your inner being to shape your thoughts, to shape your way you, you, you meditate, to shape the way you think on things? Because if you're allowing junk and lies and corruption of this and that, that's not according to the word, to be implanted in you, that's what's going to come out and defile you and render you unclean and defiled before the master.
Any thoughts before we get to Acts 10? Something you have to come closer and speak into Yes, we, you, you come sit next to Henry. There we go. Something that, uh, just, just come. So I know I'm going to ask twice, but I'd like the people online to hear too. Consider the uh, wise, wise one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I was just thinking when you were saying about um, the elders, and it, if you look at the, the traditions in the world, it's pretty much following the elders, yes, so to speak. And I, the, the passage that came to mind where Yahweh said, um, you know, you're following your elders and you're making a mockery of my words and, and, and you know, what I instruct you to do, you mock. And you're not doing what I'm instructing you to do. You, you, you're following the people. Yeah. And it, it kind of brings full circle, you know, with my experience as well, is that there is literally everything that they will expand to you, even using the scriptures, it is in justification of the elders. Yeah. You know, what they interpret as their truth, you know. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's amazing how, how, how it how simple it is, but yet we make it complicated because we're following the elders. Yeah. You know, we think the the ones that's been before us should know better, and in mm. actual fact, they don't. No. They they lead leading us off the edge, so to speak. Yeah, no, it's it's a dangerous part because you. That's where that's why Yirmiyahu sixteen says, "In the last days, the nations will come and say, our fathers inherited falsehood, futility. There's no worth in it." And we're coming to the stage as we're drawing near to his return where we are saying, we started asking the question, why are we doing? It's not, it's not a bad thing to ask, why are we doing this way? In fact, it's scriptural because when you have the Pesach meal, it says, and when your child asks you in time to come, why are we observing it this way? And you will tell them. So if the, the problem is when people stopped asking, why are we doing this? That's when the bondage of falsehood takes its grip. You know, who'd like to read Acts 10? Okay. Now there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a captain of what was called the Italian Regiment dedicated and fearing Elohim with all his household, doing many kind deeds to the people and praying to Elohim always. He clearly saw in a vision about the ninth hour of the day a messenger of Elohim coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius, and looking intently at him and becoming afraid, he said, What is it, Master? And he said to him, Your prayers and your kind deeds have come up for remembrance before Elohim. And now send men to Yafo and send for Shimon who is also called Kepha. He is staying with Shimon, a letter tanner, whose house is by the sea. And when the messenger who spoke to him went away, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a dedicated soldier, soldier from, the, from among those who waited on him continually. And having explained to them all, he sent them to Yafo. And on the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Kepha went up on the house top to pray at about the sixth hour. And he became hungry and wished to eat. But while they were preparing, he fell into a trance, and he saw the heaven open, and a certain vessel like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and laid down to earth, to the earth, in which were all kinds of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping creatures, and the birds of the heaven. And a voice came to him, Rise up, Kepha, slay and eat. But Kepha said, Not at all, master, because I have never eaten whatever is common or unclean. And a voice came to him again the second time, What Elohim has cleansed, you do not consider common. And this took place three times, and the vessel was taken back to the heaven. And while Kepha was doubting within himself about what a vision might mean, look, the men who had been sent from Cornelius, having asked for the house of Shimon, stood at the gate. And calling out, they inquired whether Shimon, also known as Kepha, was staying there. And as Kepha was thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, See, three men seek you. But rise up, go down and go with him, not doubting at all, for I have sent him. So Kepha went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius, and said, Look, 
I am the one you seek. Why have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the captain, a righteous man and one who fears Elohim, and well spoken of by the entire nation of the Yehudim, was instructed by a set-apart messenger to send for you to his house and to hear words from you. So inviting them in, he housed them, and on the next day Kepha went away with him, and some brothers from Yapo went with him. And the following day they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius was waiting for them, having called together his relatives and close friends. And it came to be that when Kepha entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and bowed before him. But Kepha raised him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And talking with him, he went in and found many who had, tuck, who had come together. And he said to them, You know that a Yehudi man is not allowed to associate with or go to one of another race. But Elohim has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. That is why I came without hesitation when I was sent for. So I asked, Why have you sent for me? And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and see, a man stood before me in shining garments, and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your kind deeds were remembered before Elohim. Now send to Yahweh and call Shimon here, who is also called Kepha. He is staying in the house of Shimon, a little tanner, by the sea. When he comes, he shall speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. And now we are all present before Elohim to hear all that you have been commanded by Elohim. And opening his mouth, Kepha said, Truly, I see that Elohim shows no partiality. But in every nation, he who fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. He sent a word to the children of Israel, bringing the good news, Peace through Yeshua Messiah. He is master of all. You know what word came to be throughout all Yehuda, beginning from Galil after the immersion which Yohanan proclaimed. Our Elohim did anoint Yeshua of Nazareth with the set-apart spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for Elohim was with him. And we are witnesses of all he did, both in the, in the country of the Yehudim and in Jerusalem, whom they even killed by hanging on a timber. Elohim raised up this one at, on the third day and let, him to, and let him be seen, not to all the people, but to witnesses, those having been chosen before by Elohim, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to proclaim to the people and to witness it, to witness that it is you who was appointed by Elohim to be judge of the living and the dead. To this one all the prophets bear witness, that through his name everyone believing in him does receive forgiveness of sins. While Kepha was still speaking these words, the set apart spirit fell upon all those hearing the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Kepha, because the gift of the set-apart spirit had been poured out on the nations also. For they were, be they were hearing them speaking with tongues and extolling Elim. And Kepha answered, Is anyone able to forbid water that these should not be immersed who have received the set-apart spirit, even as also we? And he commanded them to be immersed in the name of Yeshua Messiah. Then they asked him to remain a few days. Okay, so once again, we did touch on this when looking at the food laws, and it's important that we read this passage along with Vayikra 11 and Devarim 14, etc., because it highlights a, a clear nullification of the traditions that have been handed down in error. You know, even with Kepha, you know, he gets this vision. It's at 12 o'clock. He's hungry. It's lunchtime. He gets this vision, sees the sheet coming down three times, eat, rise, slay, and eat, you know. No, I've never eaten anything common or unclean, you know. So he acknowledges, I can't do this. You ask me to do something against the word. Here in itself is a powerful lesson because people act on their visions. They act on their spiritual experiences and make wrong decisions based on not, not lining up those things with the word of Elohim. I mean, Kepha might have said, well, I got this vision three times. I might be able to now eat now. And that's how some people interpret this passage. They think that Kepha got this, so he was commanded to do it. So, no, no, it was a test for Kepha because he eventually sees he shows he sees that Yahweh shows no partiality. When he went to the house of Cornelius, he said to Cornelius, "Do you not know that it's not permitted for Yehudi to you know eat with the nations?" That wasn't a Torah command. That was a man-made tradition. It was part of their traditions. 
You don't go eat with the, uh, uh, in ones of the nations. So he was saying, you know, this is it. And then he's there and he's seeing this and he goes, now I know Yahweh shows no partiality. He's master of all who call upon him, you know. And so this is the revelation of this vision that he got. And I think a lot of times people are premature in a little vision or a dream or something that they get and they act impulsively on that that actually breaks the word. Not looking to the word to say, hey, it's this thing is not questioning, thinking this thing's asking me because Kepha was like a bit confused about this vision at first. He thought it's not like a, it's just a stupid dream. He experienced this. Associate. Yes. No, associate. No, sorry, it wasn't. Yeah, it's not about eating. It wasn't. You shouldn't even associate with one of the nations, you know. And so, that's so contrary to the word because we're supposed to be a light to the nations. We're supposed to let them see our good works so that they can draw near. Now he's a bit confused, but he doesn't act on it and think, okay, well, whatever. And a lot of people do that. They might get a dream or a vision. They say, you know, I think Yahweh's speaking to me because this is the. And they get and they put on that spiritual voice, you know, when they talk to you, you know, because now it's like. But then when I, I've often heard something and I think, mm, that doesn't sound right in Scripture. I can't deny you had an experience, mm -hmm. but it doesn't make it right. It might be there to teach you something or it's leading to something else to show you an interpretation that you don't understand right now. Kepha didn't understand. He, all he understood is it's lunchtime, I'm hungry, I've got this vision and I don't eat what's unclean. Mean that. And it cannot mean that. That's why I'm confused and perplexed. Then the Spirit said, no, there's three men coming to see you. Go with them. So we also see there's so many lessons in here with the three times a year, etc. And it's also a clear witness and a pattern of he was constantly thinking about this vision. He wasn't going out now heralding to everybody, hey, you can eat whatever you want now. Okay. And he says, but what he did when he heard the Spirit say so he knew the voice of Yahweh, and the Spirit said, go with these men. He didn't hesitate because he's now doubting. He says, not doubting at all because I have sent them. Go with them because I've sent them, you know. So when he goes, and Cornelius is a captain. He's a leader among the nations, but he humbles himself with Kepha, and Kepha says, hey, I'm just a man like you. So this was huge for Kepha. This was also a lesson for Kepha. Because he does say, you know, I mean, he maybe he also went thinking to you as what the other's going to think I'm going here. Because he also makes it clear to him, you know, we're not supposed to associate with each other. Just check the doors and the windows. Are you okay? You know, you know that kind of thing. Because Shaul also addressed Kepha in that regard in time. So I think there was a bit of this unsureness, but Yahweh had to also deal with Kepha here to show him that Yahweh has come for the nation, you know. And when he saw the Spirit upon them, he does an important thing. Okay, so they had the Spirit. He commands that they get immersed in the name of Yeshua Messiah. You know, it's a clear witness what took place at Shavuot. Repent and be immersed in the name of Yeshua Messiah for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the set-apart Spirit. People often think, well, if I've got the gift of the set-apart Spirit, I don't need to be immersed. No, you still need to be immersed. So he commanded that that whole household got immersed. So this whole chapter has nothing to do with the changing of food laws. It has to do with the good news. Yeshua Messiah is for anyone who will call upon his name, no matter how unclean they have been, because he came to clean. And we do not call common or unclean what Yahweh separates and cleanses. It's got nothing to do with what you eat. It's got to do with people. Amen. And I love this, in every nation, he who fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. How awesome is that? And you know, we talked about traditions of elders, we brought up in different cultures, even this country itself, primarily a lot of religious debate has been brought up over separation of peoples, they are not of him. Where they're not reading what Acts 10 says, in every nation, if a people fear him and work righteousness, which is to obey then they are accepted by Yahweh. Who are you to reject somebody that's obeying Yahweh's word? Um, he was just Italian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> Italian God. Anybody want to share any thoughts on what we've been reading today? I know that we're going to... Um, 
Well, for those that are still uh, online with us, we're going to do a Zoom meeting. Um, if uh, you didn't get the invitation to the Zoom meeting and you'd like to join in in half an hour, we're going to do it. We said at half past three. Um, you can contact me. I'm putting my details on the screen. You can contact me by WhatsApp and I'll send you the link. We're just going to have a short Zoom meeting for any question and answer or any questions that you may have and we'll try and answer them. Um, of the word, yes. We're, we're, we're talking word here, you know. And, and yeah, and we certainly would love to discuss any thoughts if you have on what we've been reading today, but any other things that are, are there. We, we're doing our first Zoom meeting. We're quite excited about this as to where this may develop further down the road. We are not going to veer away from Twitch at all. We are going to stick to the pattern that we follow now, but we're looking to include interaction a little bit more, um, possibly once a month, may grow to more frequently than that, but we, we're going to do our first test run today and see when I say test run, it's it's real. <laughs> it's okay. It's uh, and so we might have one or two hiccups in our learning how it works properly, but we are trusting Yahweh to give us uh, the means to reach and interact with more and more of our covenant family, um, especially for our brothers and sisters who are joining us each week online. But then as soon as we go off, they sit there and they wish they could ask for more things, or and this is going to be the platform for it. So. Um, you want to join? Please get ready to do so, and and, and uh, we'll we'll be with you on Twitch, not on Twitch, on Zoom, in half an hour. So, unless anybody would like to share anything before we close, anybody online would like to share anything before we close, I'll give a moment. Otherwise, we're going to pray and then get set up for our Zoom session shortly. I was just thinking that it was quite a sort of a curve in because the vision appeared to him three times and there was three unclean men that came to fetch him. Yes. Well, three men. Not unclean men. <laughs> but in his eyes, <laughs> unclean men. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, like, you know, most folks will have a vision and they'll have a vision once. Yeah. And they'll act on it and, you know, go with him every way and do whatever. But in his case, he had the same vision three times, and there were then three men calling on him. Uh, and not like in some of the other scriptures where there's one or two men that get sent out, you know, to either call on somebody or collect somebody. Yes. This time there's three men that came. Yeah. And what we also see in the text is that those three men, he didn't just go immediately, he, they stayed overnight, so they would have had discussions. They would have talked through the night. They would have discussed what's going on and shared things. So when he went there, he kind of went saying, okay, I, I see that here's an Elohim fearing man that's not a Yehudi. This is like, what does this mean? This, this, this is a, well, in our, our terminology, this is front page news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was a big, big challenge for Kefir and a, and a, and a, and a wonderful revelation for him to show that the good news of Yahweh is not limited. <laughs> news. Yeah. That's the news that we ought to be proclaiming, you know. Okay, let's pray. Master Yahweh, we bless and praise your wondrous name. We thank you that you've given us such wonderful insight into your word. You show us wonders from your word, and we continue to see your presence, your joy in us. And we thank you that we, we can sit here and being immersed in your word and just seeing new things coming out more and more. And even the old things that are just being renewed in us. I pray that you continue to stir in us the life that's in your word so that we can fan into flame that good deposit, not let the fire go out and keep our fire from being strange. We bless you and praise you. And we thank you that we have an eighth to look forward to. And may we guard our lamps with oil in it, walking according to your truth, so that when you do come to fetch us, we may be found to be dressed and ready, burning bright, welcomed into your presence to praise you and esteem you in the name of Yahushua, our Messiah. Master Yahweh, we thank you for your blessing of good health and your provision over us. We also pray now as we connect over Zoom that you would bless the interaction that we can have as a body together. And for our brothers and sisters that are far and wide watching these recordings later. I also pray you bless each home 
where your word can be shared. As we continue to serve you and honor you in everything that we say and do, in the name of Yahushua, our Messiah, Amen and Amen.